Namaste. Okay, there's a lot of food in our stomach, that means. <laughs> so before we start with our session, let me see if I can help you all digest the food. Some mind exercises, some questions. Uh, what comes to your mind when I say the word Yudhishthira? What is that one thing that comes to your mind? Dharma, peace. Okay. What is that comes to your mind when I say the word Shakuni? Shakuni. Kind of, okay. I'll tell you what comes to my mind. Politics. I've never admired any politician as I've admired Shakuni. So, who's right it was? Dhritarashtras or King Pandus? Who's ever it was? Now, the next generation. Who's right it was? Gauravas or Pandavas? Okay, I will just leave you with those questions. Namaste, I am Akash Dandapani and I am from Bharat. Our next session is on topic politics and human rights. Even today, Hindus continue to be amongst the most persecuted and neglected communities in many parts of the world, including Pakistan, Bangladesh, Southeast Asia, the Gulf, West Asia, and even in parts of Bharat itself. Despite being such a large community, what are the factors that we have prevented us from speaking out? What are the avenues available for us to get involved in human rights based efforts to protect the most vulnerable within our community? I'm pleased to introduce the chairperson of our next session, Sri Sushyan Subramanian. Sri Sushyan Subramanian lives in Australia and has been a member of Hindu Youth Australia since 2011. He has helped in organizing youth conferences, retreats, forums, blood donation drives, and free planting events. He is a member of the Royal Australian Army, enlisting as a command support club in 2016. He is currently posted in Northern Territory. While being in the Australian Army, he continues to follow the path of Hindu Dharma and has donated a copy of Bhagavad Gita to the Australian Army. He has a Bachelor of Economics from the University of Sydney. So young ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome Sir Shyam. Good afternoon everyone. I'd just like to invite the panelists also on stage. So is there is there a right? So welcome to this session, which is on um, politics and uh, human rights uh, regarding the Hindu people. I will be giving a brief introduction where I'll be mainly focusing on the conditions of the Hindus in various parts of the world. Uh, Mayuriji will be uh, presenting on uh, her experiences in the political politics side in the UK. Um, Himanshuji will be uh, showcasing his success story as a parliamentarian and in the ministry in Norway. And um, uh, Devi Kaji will be showing us of what GHRD, that's Global Human Rights Defense, has done to highlight the plight of Hindus in countries such as Pakistan and Bangladesh where their conditions are downright miserable. So. I will be giving a brief background on our conditions and I'll be focusing on part of the Western countries, um, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Malaysia and Indonesia. I'll constantly highlight as a recurring theme as the lack of coverage we have received on this issue from the media and what steps we could take to perhaps save our brethren who are being persecuted in those countries. So I'll just put out the points as far as the background is concerned. So, as you all know, Hindus are the majority in Bharat and Nepal, in more than 190 different countries, we're not the majority. 
if I were to explain the conditions in every one of those countries, I'll be here forever. But I have focused on the countries that I've mentioned, and the countries that I've mentioned on the slide here, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and Indonesia, are the ones with most of the issues. Now, Indonesia, I understand, was discussed yesterday when uh, Pritikaji gave that presentation um, in the absence of uh, Nikiji. But I'll still give an overview of what the bigger picture for the Indonesian Hindus and their problems are. So, I'll first start with Bharat. I think everyone's talked about this uh, many times, about how there is a huge flaw in Bharatiya secularism. You know, there's a saying with that, I'm a proud Muslim, said the Muslim. I'm a proud Christian, said the Christian. I'm a proud atheist, said the atheist. I'm a proud Hindu, said the communalist. That's literally how it works in Paras. And the way in which they've defined secularism, and in the constitution, you've got Article 30, correct me if I'm wrong, it is pretty discriminatory. It's one of many articles which is discriminatory against the Hindus. And you know of Article 370 and the situation in Jammu and Kashmir, where literally Hindus are second-class citizens in that state, as per Article 370 in itself. And just to add on to that, you've got the Temple Endowments Act, where part of being a secular country, you'd think there should be separation of government and religious institutions, right? Wrong. If you're a Hindu, your temples are controlled by the state authorities. And whatever tax money they pay, those state authorities then fund mosques, fund madrasas, and fund subsidies for people to go to Hajj. That's what happens. They're misusing Hindu funds. And of course, on the educational front, I'm sure it was addressed about how the Right to Education Act is there as a discrimination against Hindu institutions in favor of minority institutions. Also, there's a general underreporting in the tax on Hindus. I'm sure everyone would have heard of the entire global media talking about what happened in Dadri to um, Aklak. But how many in this room, I ask, is well aware of what happened to Prashant Pujari in Mudpidri in Karnataka? Anyone? I'd like to show, see a show of hands. Who knows about Prashant Pujari? Or at least one hand or two hands. That's it. No one covered it. And yes, he was killed, butchered by cattle smugglers, jihadist cattle smugglers, might I add. And that has no prime time de debates. BBC, CNN, all these fake news prostitutes have no balls to show this on their national media or internationally. I'll tell you straight up, that is what the case is. And here are some few articles. And even that recent case about the sadhus being killed in UP, killed by cattle smugglers, in a temple, and as a result of that, the Sabus have all had to flee that town because the cattle smugglers are killing these Sabus who are fighting for cattle rights. And now I'll bring up issues in the West. Now I'd like to say, oh, went too far, like that. Anyway, there are too many issues. Um, as far as I, the West is concerned, we don't have too much problems. I mean, we control our temples. We have not too many issues regarding that. And I'm sure the California textbook controversy was mentioned yesterday. I'm not gonna go too much into detail with that, but there was one issue in Australia that happened last year. Meat and Livestock Australia published an ad, and in that they had Lord Vinayagar eating lamb. Now, let me say this. I know Meat and Livestock Australia wanted to showcase Hindus being part of Australian society, and they wanted to show that how integrated they are. I have no issues with that. The only issue is when they showed Vinayagar eating lamb, and the fact is that they left out one particular religion in that ad. And I think we all know which one they conveniently left out, for what obvious reasons. Anyway, we did file a petition, and eventually they did take down that ad. But compared with what you see in Bharat, these are minuscule issues, and we're doing quite well for ourselves in Australia without too many major problems. So again, I've just got a couple of articles in relation to that. Now I may get to the meat of the issue, which is the conditions of Hindus in Pakistan. And I've put the facts and figures out there. So you've seen a systematic demographic annihilation of Hindus in Pakistan since 1947. From 15% of the population today, they're under 2%. You have Hindu temples being destroyed. There is a temple in Karachi, a thousand years old, used as a public toilet. If you're a Hindu that drinks water from a tap, from a mosque, you will be beaten up, your houses will be torched, 
and you will be driven out of the village. And every year, uh, every month, 25 Hindu girls are kidnapped, forcibly converted, and married off to Muslim men. And I'm sure that Devikaji will be talking about a few cases involving uh, such incident when she comes on stage with her presentation later on. Might I also add there's also the constant demonization of Hindus in their media, in their political sphere, and all these other things. And what sickens me is despite that, you still invite Pakistanis to Bollywood movies. Just saying. And I just want to ask, who's aware of this case? This happened last year. Anyone in this room aware of this one? So for those who aren't aware, I'll just put out the fact. So 27-year-old married Hindu woman goes to a temple in Jakobabad with her mother-in-law and children. On the way back, gets kidnapped. And luckily in this case, fortunately, her mother-in-law um, made a huge crime. The townspeople and the local Hindu community leaders got involved and they blocked the highways and they rescued the girl after her husband filed a, uh, filed a criminal case to the police and they got the perpetrator arrested. I'd like to mention that this is perhaps the one case I know of where the girl was saved. But the fact that a married Hindu woman could still be kidnapped and tortured the way in which she was does not give us too much hope if you're a single Hindu woman or underage Hindu woman. Because many of them get kidnapped, forcibly converted and married, and they are never see they're never allowed to see the light of another day. So now I bring up Bangladesh, another country where the conditions of Hindus is downright miserable. So when it was East Pakistan they passed the East Bengal Evacuee Act. So what they did was that they stripped Hindus of all economic power. Because before that, Hindus had the economic power in all of Bengal, including East Bengal. But doing that meant that the Hindus had their property taken away from them and they were sent out of the country. You had the 1971 war, the genocide that happened, three million dead Bangladeshis out of that 80% were Hindus. And out of the ones who remained, they passed in the Vested Property Act, which is a continuation of the East Bengal Evacuee Act. 40% of the remaining Hindus have seen their property taken away from them. And you've seen the constant destruction of uh, temples and uh, Hindu homes, again the forced conversions, the kidnappings and the killings and the rioting. These are very much commonplace in Bangladesh for the Hindus, the daily life. And the next slide showcases the facts and figures of the conditions of Hindus in Bangladesh. That sums it up right there. Less than 9% as of the 2011 census. This is as per the Bangladesh government's own data, might I add. This is not some Sangi data. And here's the thing, if this continues, there's going to be no Hindus left in Bangladesh in a few time, in a few moments. So here are another article I talked about in Bangladesh, and this is in relation to a riot that's happened over there about um, a Hindu person who apparently posted something inflammatory against the Muslims, and then the Muslims retaliated and burned down the Hindu homes and killed a few Hindus. And I think this picture is, um, in retrospect, encapsulates what's going on in Bangladesh day in and day out. So now I bring up Sri Lanka. It's something that's not often discussed again, but it should be noted that in 1915 there were 25% of Sri Lanka's population. They're now under 12.6%. The two reasons that why that happened, number one, the Bharatiya Tamils were stripped of their citizenship and sent back to Parth, and the Sri Lankan Civil War, which created a massive refugee crisis and the exodus of um, Sri Lankan Tamil refugees. And you've seen in the absence of the Sri Lankan Tamils, the Buddhist nationalists have gone in, they've destroyed a lot of those temples and converted them into Buddhist temples. You have the Christian missionary groups who are active in there, obviously doing their conversions. And in the uh, district of Manda, in particular, they're active in trying to close down a lot of those um, temples there. The one area in contention is the Tirkati Shoram Kobi. That was destroyed by the Portuguese. As per the efforts of Arnugam Narvat, they rebuilt that temple. But even now, 
there's often a lot of dispute that's happening over there because the missionary groups are not allowing the Hindus to freely practice. And of course then you've got the Muslim areas where, as I've mentioned in the past, in the previous nights, the, area, the problems are well known. So at least here, you've got the Shiva Sena that has formed. And I'd like to point out to one quote that they've mentioned over there, which is that for 60 years the Hindus of Sri Lanka have sacrificed their interests at the altar of Tamil unity. And in that sense, I have to say that this has been the fundamental problem for the Hindus. And the fact that we have seen too much, we've sacrificed our interest for linguistic unity or some sort of fallacy which will never happen. And that only when we put up our interests first, can we at least try and save our brethren. And now I bring up Malaysia and Indonesia. Now in Malaysia, the issue is more in the legal aspect, where um, what you see there is um, under Malaysia favors Muslims over Hindus, that's where their constitution. They do destroy a lot of temples and everything else over there. I'll, get, I'll be quick, don't worry. There's <laughs> a lot to cover. Right, so what, what you see there is also in cases where a divorce happens, under custodial law, the child goes to the mother. Unfortunately, if the father converts to Islam, the child goes to the father. And there are cases like that that happen in Malaysia. And in Indonesia, the main issue I want to focus on is the undercounting of Hindus. The 4 million is what the Indonesia's government recognizes as per their census. But Parisada Hindu Dharma Indonesia recognizes 18 million. The reason is because the Indonesian government only recognizes the Balinese as Hindus, not those who come from Java, Sumatra, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, or any of these other islands that exist in that country. Because they're not Balinese or they don't follow the Balinese strand of Hindu Dharma. So again, I've got a couple of articles. Again, Malaysia is where Zakir Naik is, for anyone that's well aware, and there's a massive protest that's going on in that country at the moment to get Zakir Naik out of Malaysia. So finally, how to address the issue? Well, we can basically, at least we're here, I think we'll be uh, told in the later presentations on how we can address these issues, but first and foremost, we can start by simply boycotting economically Pakistan and Bangladesh. We can put more pressure on the governments to take more action to ensure that these countries that are mentioned where the Hindu rights are at their miserable, the government should be pressured to take action against those countries. I mean, we still have the power to do that. We can petition them. We could do whatever. Fundamentally, we need to make that plunge first. Until we take that plunge, unfortunately, we can't rely on someone else to take care of our interests. Hari Om. Right, so I'll introduce our next panelist. That's um, Srimati Mayuri Parma Amin. She is the founder of Parma Advisory. She was appointed the Director of Conservative Friends of Bharat in 2013, connecting the Bharatiya diaspora to the Conservative Party and contributing to the majority wing at the 2015 general election. As the deputy head of the Diverse Communities Unit at Policy Exchange, Mayuri focuses her research on diversity and equality in the UK. Mayuri advises the Ministry for External Affairs Bharat on utilizing social media to connect the Bharatiya diaspora in the UK and across the world. In 2018, Bharatiya Inc. recognized her as a 35 under 35 young leaders in Bharat UK relations. So I invite her onto the stage right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, esteemed panelists, organizers, delegates, and friends, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak here today at this wonderful and, and inspiring um, gathering of Hindu youth and students. So today, I want to speak to you about why you, as Hindu youth, and why we, as a community, must care about politics, and why I think that making politics a vocation will really make a difference to society as a whole. I'm especially excited about this today, because I think that having more impact in politics means that we will be able to strengthen and actually position Hindus within society. We've already made significant strides in other areas, as we've seen by the people attending and speaking in this conference, whether it's in professional services, education, the legal field, sciences, and I could, I could, the list goes on. 
Yet the Hindu World Democratic Forum yesterday said that actually there's only 101 Hindu parliamentarians across the world, and that's out of a population of 1.1 billion Hindus in the world. So for me, I think we've actually got some work to do. We gather today on the 125th anniversary of Swami Vivekananda's poignant speech at the Parliament of World Villages. And as I was reading through his address again in preparation for this, I was struck by his description of civilization and the ills plaguing it. And as I was reading it, I thought, gosh, not a lot has changed. He says, sectarianism, bigotry, and its horrible descendant, fanaticism, have long possessed this beautiful earth. They have filled the earth with violence, drenched it often, and often with human blood, destroyed civilization, and set nations into despair. Does that sound familiar? Over the past decade, we've seen financial and geopolitical crises dividing domestic politics across the world. And I think, actually, it's given rise to extreme ideologies that actually threaten core economic values of harmony, peace, tolerance, inclusion, compassion, accountability, and integrity. Whether this relates to Brexit in my own country, the election of a controversial president, this side of the pond, Russians meddling in foreign elections, the prospect of a cyber war with China, attacks on free speech and civil liberties, and of course, the abuse of human rights, which Tishwant Dish so eloquently and passionately put to us. I think the world's in a troubled place. And although we've got social media and we have technology to engage with some of these global problems and to engage with the discourse, what remains true is that true decision-making power <coughs> remains in traditional forms of government and traditional establishments <coughs> of power. And actually, we have yet to make a dent in this particular area. The state of affairs itself is a call to action. Pericles, Oops, sorry. Pericles, who was um, an Athenian leader in the 5th century BC, said, just because you don't, do not take an interest in politics does not mean that politics doesn't take an interest in you. Political decision making permeates every single aspect of our lives. The moment that we're born, perhaps into, into a government funded hospital, through to the education that we receive, the roads that we drive on, and the taxes that we never we have to pay. Despite this, we only seem to get involved when it actually affects us, or when politics takes an interest in us. And at that point, it might just be too late. My argument today is that making politics a vocation and a career will make us become positive change makers in the world. The world needs decisive and strong leadership for the good of people. And I believe that some of those leaders, driven by a strong karmic identity, led by strong primary values and armed with innovative primary solutions to global problems might just be sitting in the room today. So, what can Hindu representation in politics enable for us as a community? So I think firstly, it allows us to be proactive rather than reactive to short-term political situations. I'll give you the example of the issue of caste legislation in the UK. The UK government was going to make caste discrimination on the basis of caste illegal, and they're going to put the word caste into UK statute. Now we all know that firstly caste does not belong to the Taramik tradition as a word, it's a Portuguese word. Also it's completely misunderstood. Now the fact that this was even considered to go onto UK legislation is a travesty in its own right. If we had the right people advising at the right levels, whether it was in the civil service, in parliament, Perhaps we wouldn't have needed a long and lengthy public consultation only for the government to finally realise that it shouldn't have been put into legislation. And related to this, by participating in politics and having representation, we actually learn where the power lies. We understand where the levers and mechanisms of change are. And actually we need to participate to, to really understand that. So when we're thinking about marginal or Hindu-focused issues like forced marriage, Hindu human rights, we can actually use the right levers to get these issues onto the desks of the right people. 
not just those issues, but actually will be shaping the future policy agenda for society as a whole. We can actually, you all know that Parliament policy solutions have, we've got solutions for everything from things like the housing crisis in the UK, provisions for care for an aging population, or even climate change. So why should we actually impact the uh, policy agenda as a whole to affect society? And with representation at the right levels, much like Kim Anshuji in Norway, we can actually provide excellent role models for people sitting in this room today. We know that there's a problem with youth engagement across the world. At the last UK election, only 43% of people under 29 elected, uh, voted, and this was after they complained about Brexit. In, in the US, despite the polarising discourse that was happening at the last election, only 50% of people under 29 voted. So there's a real problem here, and I think if we have strong, um, um, integ strong uh, role models with integrity, young people may yet be more engaged. So how do I think we could actually get involved? Um, as you saw from my biography, I'm, I've benefited and I've been fortunate that I've actually had a career spanning different areas of politics. And for me, politics is much wider than just being an elected official. So um, I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of where you might be able to get involved. So firstly, we've got the party political system. So you can be a volunteer or you can work for the party itself, whether it's on campaigns, fundraising, if you're an accountant, you can be an accountant for the party. Right? But get involved because you actually learn about what the landscape looks like. You can, of course, become an elected official um, at the national, on the nas national stage, but why not at the local stage as well? State level, district level, council level. We've also got, and at that point you're kind of making legislation, uh, you're debating legislation, you're scrutinising it, but then you also need people to implement that legislation. So you could actually work for the civil service, think about what it's like to actually make policy or perhaps deliver that policy and actually be at the coal front working um, for organisations that manage the delivery of their services. So we've got NHS England, for example, that manages healthcare services in the UK. Actually being at a high level there, you can make an impact. And finally, if, if the traditional forms of government bore you, you could actually work for a big tank. You can actually start making policy or perhaps pressure group like change the org. Where you, if you're interested in a particular single issue policy, you can actually make a difference that way. So, what do I think you can do today before you leave the room or after you leave the room, perhaps? There's a, there's a few things that I think you can do. You can join a political party or pressure group. You should network, meet as many people as you can. Every person is an opportunity, um, and you never know um, how uh, contacts can help you. Find out who your local officials are, write to them, see if there's open internships available so you can actually find out what it's like on the ground. Read the first hand experience of your kind of idols. So, you know, I, I, I read political biographies, I learn from um, the experiences of, of great people as well. And find your voice. And actually, I was going to say, uh, before you do all of this, you need to find your voice. So, it's really important that you ask yourself questions about what you believe in and what you stand for. And then you can actually hold those views with conviction um, in the public arena. Because actually, if you don't have that conviction, um, we can't really remain, remain true to ourselves. And we need politicians that can remain true to themselves. So finding your voice is really important. Now, before I finish, I want to leave you with something to think about. A friend of mine recently did a survey in the UK and he looked at politics um, and Hindus and he, he asked this question, he said, should Hindus get more actively involved in politics? What does everyone think here? Raise your hands if you think Hindus should be more actively involved. Okay, not bad. So, 80% said yes, definitely, we need more people in politics. He then asked, would you consider standing in political elections? Now, raise your hand if you, if you consider doing it. No, it's a lot less than, 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 than what we saw. And it's kind of the same here. Although 80% said that we need more engagement, 77% said 
saying, I'm not going to do it myself, or actually I'm unsure. Um, and for me, this is a really telling statistic because you know, we recognise that there's a need for representation. We recognise the benefits that are involved. Um, but interest is just low. So what is it that's holding us back? Are we afraid that it's going to cost too much? Are we afraid that we might lose face if we fail? Do we think it's not a worthy pursuit, like being a doctor or a, law or a lawyer? What is the issue? We need to change it. And I'm going to leave you with this, and it's based on the Bhagavad Gita, but it was spoken by Mahatma Gandhi. It's the action, not the fruit of the action, that's important. You have to do the right thing. It may not be in your power, may not be in your time, but there'll be any fruit. But that doesn't mean you stop doing the right thing. You may never know what results come from your action, but if you do nothing, there will be no result. Thank you for listening. Our next speaker is um, Sri Himanshu Gulapiti. He is a member of parliament from Norway who has served as a deputy minister of justice of Norway at the age of 25 and for three years was deputy minister slash state secretary in the prime minister's office. Gulati has traveled to more than 140 different countries and has also directed a Hindi feature film. He has been invited as a um, guest of honor by the government of Paris to attend next year's Pravasi Bharatiya Divas, Kumbh Mela, and the Republic Day celebrations. So I invite uh, Himanshu Ji on the stage. Thank you for a very nice introduction and uh, thank you for those who have spoken before me as well. Uh, my name is Himanshu Gulati, I'm from Norway. Uh, and before me have uh, spoken about um, very serious uh, issues uh, and I'm happy that they've raised those issues. Uh, my presentation is a little bit different. It's about uh, encouraging people to go um, uh, <coughs> politics as Mayuri did, did as well uh, in the end. But I want to I wanna give my advice as what one should do in order to succeed <laughs> in politics based on the experience that I have. Because politics is not about strategy and, and you know, even though that's important as well, the most important thing in politics is about integrity, what you stand for. If you want to make a difference, you need to stand for something. And what do you believe in? That's my question to you. What do you believe in? You should believe in something strong enough worth fighting for, maybe even worth dying for, if you want to make a difference, in my opinion, in politics. You know, there's a saying, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And uh, I believe that you know, a lot of the politicians who are most respected uh, in today's society are people who dare to be different and dare to stand for something. For instance, uh, John McCain, Senator John McCain, who just passed away you know, about a week ago, I think, uh, you know, one of the most respected politicians in the United States. In his funeral, his opponent uh, as, a, as president came to, to, to hold a speech because the guy dared to stand for something. Even when it went against his party, even when it went against many of his supporters, he stood up for what he believed was right. So it's important to have something you believe in. For me, liberty was what brought me to politics. Ideology, that everybody deserves to decide in their own lives, uh, and that you know, the government should have less influence, and that one should have less restrictions. For me, that was what brought me into, politi into politics as a teenager when I was recruited at high school. For somebody else, it could be something else. It could be fighting injustice. We've heard a lot of good examples, or bad examples, I have to say, about injustice in the world. But you need to believe in something that you're willing to fight for. And as Gandhiji also said, you must be the change you want to see in the world. And what you stand for will be tested. When I was in, um, in school, I remember uh, um, this quote hanging on the wall of my history teacher's classroom. It said, I might not believe in what you are saying, but I will fight with my life for your right to say. This was something that stuck into my mind, and it's a quote I always remember. But even I, as a politician, have tested on this. What when those people I hate, the people I oppose, the people I've dedicated my career to fighting against, 
when their rights are, uh, um, are, are challenged as well. You know, that's when you are tested. What do you stand for? Do you have the spine to stand up or not? And even uh, ahead of this conference, and I'm very happy to see so many fellow speakers here, because I think almost every speaker who was attending this conference, was targeted before this conference, urged to, uh, to withdraw. In my case, uh, an email was sent to every 169 member of parliament in Norway, urging them to tell the Mount Shugulari to withdraw from this conference. I mean, that just made me even more fired up to come here, because if somebody is trying to... Yeah, I, mean, I do agree with everything that the organizers of this conference stand for, and, but that does not matter. I'm here to give my, uh, my uh, message and say what I believe in. But uh, we, if you believe in something strong enough, you must stand for it, also when it is sometimes uh, challenging you as a demo. And this is another advice for me. I believe that you are only a contender in the game you, chose to play, you choose to play. Barack Obama was elected president of the United States. He was only a junior senator from this state, Illinois. Unless you take the step and you are there and you dare to run for something or do something, you will not achieve it. Christopher Columbus was looking for India. He didn't find India, but he found America. But he, he, he took the risk of, 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 of participating in that day. Barack Obama, who nobody had even heard of, except for uh, some people in the United States, because he was a senator, but in the world he was unknown. Uh, but once he chose to run, he was a candidate. So my point is, one should stand up, be brave enough, and somehow dare to do things even beyond his imagination. Because if you don't try, you will not achieve. And you are only a contender in the game you yourself choose to play. Uh, and this is um, something, I, I was in Chennai for the first time in my life a couple of weeks ago, and there is Swami Vivekananda house there, which I uh, coincidentally passed by and I chose to go in and and have a look at the exhibitions, and they have made a nice video of a speech in Chicago 125 years ago. And one of the things he said is that, and I cannot read the top of it, but yeah, it is that if, uh, if there's anything this parliament of world, world religions has proved, it is that holiness, purity, and charity are not the exclusive possessions of any church in the world, and that every system has produced men and women of the most exalted kind. In the face of this evidence, if anybody dreams of the exclusive survival of his own religion and the destruction of others, I pity him from the bottom of my heart. It is important that we remember this. These were wise words uttered 125 years ago. Because even when we are fighting the injustice done against Hindus, as is very clearly mentioned by the speakers before me, we must be sure not to do injustice on others. Because if not, we are just, uh, you know, we are, even though we are taking two steps forward, we are still taking one step uh, back. And this is an important message for all of us to remember as well. And that brings me to the next point of this uh, answer, technical trouble here. If you're in, if religion is the reason you're in politics, I believe you should not be in politics. Because religion is an extremely important part of our life. It forms us, our faith makes us who we are, but our faith is something that we use in our lives as human beings to become the persons we are. But in society, I believe politics is a different operating system. So even though religion is extremely important to us, we should be proud when we say we are Hindus, and the principles of Hinduism should form our characters, I believe that in politics, religion should not be the guiding force. We've seen it other places happen, and it's not gone well. So my point is, stand for your religion, be proud of who you are, take the best from your religion, but in politics it's important that you also stand for uh, the changes you want to do in society, especially all of us living in countries where the majorities are not Hindus. Still, our religion has a lot to contribute to these countries, but uh, the changes we want to do has to be based on uh, another ideology, another uh, political program, and, and it's important to take this uh, with in politics. My last advice is to be yourself and dare to be different. And I mentioned some um, politicians earlier, like I mentioned John McCain, even I have many uh, people who stand for the complete opposite of me in politics than what I do. One example is the American senator, uh, Bernie Sanders, who is a socialist, and I represent a party which is the total uh, opposite of socialism. But Bernie Sanders, I have to commend him, he did a great uh, job. He ran against Hillary Clinton, one of the most popular politicians in the world, and yet he gave her uh, a really hard uh, time for her, for her money. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, although he lost in the end uh, against her, uh, he was a serious candidate. Because he did, to, even in America, the country of liberty, where socialism is usually uh, spat at, he did to uh, stand for something, be different. I think that brought him where he was. I could say the same about many other people who, who I think, achieve great things. They dare to be different no matter what people say. Uh, and that is an important thing, not to care about what people say. If you believe in something strong enough, stand for it. And do enter politics, because politics is the way of changing the way society works. I think Mayuri had a great example. Most of us are probably born in publicly funded hospitals. Our entire life is affected by decisions made in politics every day. So we can choose either to be on the side and let others decide for us, or we can choose to be a part of the political system and make sure that our voice and what we stand for counts in the way our societies work in the future. Thank you for the attention. That's a great message right there, Himanshu Ji. Just stand up for what you believe in. Don't give, a, don't give a damn about what the others have to say for you. Anywho. Next up is uh, Shushri Devika Sitol. She's studying for her Master's in Law at Leiden University in the Netherlands and is an active volunteer at Global Human Rights Defence, GHRD. GHRD is an international human rights non-governmental organisation that promotes and advocates human rights in areas where Hindus and other minorities are targeted in regular human rights violations and where global attention for these abuses are lacking. In December 2015, GHRD was granted the special consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, ECOSOC as it's known as. So I'd invite Devika Ji onto the stage. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, Namaskar. Today I will be speaking on behalf of GHRD, Global Human Rights Defense. Firstly, I want to thank the organizers of the Youth Conference for having us here again. Uh, we're very honored to be here. Before I'll start uh, talking about the human rights violations of Hindus uh, in South Asia, I first will explain uh, who we are and what we do. Global Human Rights Defense is a human rights organization that focuses on human rights abuses of minorities in South Asia and mostly in areas where global media attention uh, of these abuses are lacking. Our home base is in The Hague in the Netherlands, but we work internationally with local organizations and human rights activists in South Asia. To, to achieve our mission, we have three pillars. Um, our work is based on these pillars. Pillar one is about human rights monitoring and advocacy. To monitor human rights, we partner with local observers who know the country's tradition, social political context, and who can do research for us. Our observers investigate alleged human rights violations and pressure government and judiciary to investigate. Our second pillar is based on human rights empowerment. We organize local projects and projects in Europe to empower people and minorities and to aid them. Uh, and we help try to help communities who are victims of human rights abuses as much as we can. Our third pillar is about human rights education. Uh, we organize educational projects and awareness raising events. These events take part in South Asia and Europe, such as documentary screenings or in events on the International Human Rights Day event. Since our existence, we have grown a lot. Uh, we have expanded in more and more countries. We have more activists working for us. And we can finally say that we've built really strong networks in Europe and in Asia. Through our lobbying, we now have access to the European Union and UN institution. And uh, we're really proud to say that we have the ECOSAC label, which also grants us more um, contact with the UN and makes us able to share our documents and research work. Now that I've explained who we are and what we do, I want to talk about the human rights violations of Hindus, and more specifically uh, on first conversions of small girls in Pakistan. There are a lot of abuses in our community which we don't know of. 
There are multiple reasons why these news don't reach us through media channels or through um, word of mouth or other sources. This is the exact problem. We don't know what is happening within our community. And I want to talk about the abuses that are targeted at a really vulnerable part of our community, and that is of uh, the abductions, rapes, and conversions of small Hindu girls in Pakistan. We have researched cases of multiple young teenage girls from Pakistan with either a Hindu, a Christian, or a Sikh background, who were abducted, had to forcefully marry their abductor, and convert to their religion. They are taken away from their families, and they never see their families again. The figures might shock you, but besides the fact that he has also said uh, minorities in Pakistan have decreased to a small 3-2% and it's estimated that at least a thousand girls every year are the victim of forced conversions in Pakistan. At least a thousand girls a year. This is a shocking number and it's quite disastrous that a lot of us didn't even know this. I was shocked at it myself and I thought how is it possible that we don't know it? Why doesn't this news reach us? <coughs> Um, some reasons why this news don't reach us, uh, I've put on the slide. There is a lack of media coverage and a lot of fake news. The process to get these girls back is really long. So for families, it's not able, they're not able to financially uh, pursue the case, so they eventually stop it. And this results in cases which are left unopened. There are no fake verdicts, so we don't hear of resolved cases. Specifically, a lot of illiterate and poor families are targeted, families who don't have the means to get their daughters back. There is a really big corrupt system at the moment in Pakistan, which uh, gives no means to uh, try to resolve these cases. And there's a wrong application of the law. There are laws to protect girls uh, from being abducted and converted and forcibly taken away, but these laws are not enforced or are not explained properly. I want to explain these cases uh, with a case study, and that is the case study of Kajal Peel. Kajal Peel was 12 years old when she was asleep at her home. She was not alone, her two brothers were at home, but her parents were not During the night on the 21st October of 2014, she was abducted at gunpoint by two strange men. She was taken away and her brothers couldn't do anything about it. Her parents came home the day after and found out what had happened. They immediately rushed to the police, who actually did not take the case seriously and did not even file a report. Later that day, the family was called by two strange men telling them that they had her daughter, she was abducted, she was married to a man they didn't know, and she was now converted. A couple of weeks later, in court, Kato made a statement that the Marriage was done voluntarily. She wanted to stay with her abductor. Why would a girl say that when she has been forced to be taken away? It is because the girls like her, they are threatened that people will kill her family if she says something. For the case of respecting and trying to protect her family, she kept her mouth shut. A 12-year-old girl kept her mouth shut. Even though she said this, it is still illegally it's still illegal, sorry, to marry a minor in Pakistan. So her parents showed her birth certificate to the court. The court didn't, found, didn't uh, redeem the uh, certificate as enough. So the court did something horrific. The court ordered a very humiliating and potentially painful medical exam to prove Kato's age. A doctor came to medically examine 12-year-old to see how old she was. And the doctor surprisingly came to the conclusion that Kaja was seven years old, which would still mean that she was a minor. The judge chose to apply Sharia law, which states that a girl can marry any man if she's ready to bear a child. This would be the case for a 17 years old. Kaja's parents were still not ready to give up. Further hearings kept on getting postponed, and in February 2015, her parents were still fighting. The eighth hearing had gotten postponed for the fifth time, and meanwhile, Kajal still had to stay with her abductor. Can you imagine how her abductor must have treated her, knowing that there's still a case going on because her parents won't give up? 
The night hearing took place in December 2015, and her parents actually were forced to stop pursuing the case more than a year later. The lengthy process had put a lot of pressure on her financial situation, and they had lost trust in the judicial system. They were not expecting a fair judgment anymore, and like many other minority families, they just had to accept the fact that they would never see their daughter again. There are many more cases like these, and many more girls with horrifying stories. More stories about girls like Anjali Maywar, who cried for her mother in her first court case, but after a while simply said, yes, okay, it was voluntarily because she was threatened. Girls who had to live in hostels during trial and were not able to meet their family, but somehow their husbands were able to meet them and threaten them to say fake facts in court. As you can see, there are multiple reasons why uh, these cases don't get solved, and that's a big reason why we don't hear of it. These unsolved cases don't get any news, the media does not want to cover it, and most of the families are scared of threats and do not know how to get word out. How do we raise our voice against these human rights violations? We can do it alone, I can do it alone, and you can do it alone. We can only do it as a community. I use the word community, and I don't only mean the Hindu community. Every community, on the basis of principles of basic human rights and humanity, should stand against these violations, the abuses against minorities, and the abduction of small girls. We should stand against the violence against minorities, stand against this majority who has the system behind them and who think they can do anything with impunity. These minorities have the right to live freely and to live with the religion they choose of. They should not hide, they should not flee. There are no criminals on the basis of their religion. So what is this NOS about? This is not about politics. This is not about bashing people, because somehow that's the response we sometimes get in our community when talking about subjects like these. Is that the reason why we as a Hindu community don't get to know about these cases? The discussion just dies? I want to say it again, this is about our humanity. We need to remind ourselves of that. We as a Hindu community should uphold these principles of humanity and help us, help these daughters, help these brothers, help these sisters. Why don't we show up? Why don't we stay active? We praise, we praise Indian brave hearts. Brave hearts who are able to do so much as strong individuals. Why can't we be brave? Why can't we be brave together? Brave to shine a light on these violations and brave to do anything to stop it. We will never be able to do it alone. We will only be able to do it together. These Hindu daughters of Pakistan should not be afraid. They have us to protect them. Their government may turn a blind eye, but we should not. We should force the government and human rights councils to confront these violations, to take up their responsibility and stop these atrocities. So how do we raise our voice against this? By making sure that this discussion does not die, by coming out publicly, and by forcing the state of Pakistan to persecute by being active. We actually need your help right away, because in two weeks we're having a big protest about 250 men in Geneva. And we would like to ask you to please help us share this, follow our Facebook page, share the event, like the event, we actually asked this also for Kajal Hill's case four years ago at the first conference. And we as a community have failed her. And please, we should not fail any more girls. We should save them because that's our responsibility. Thank you for having me. Right, so now we're here at the Q&A session. So for anyone who has questions, please come up the front and just line up over here. And um, that way you can ask your questions to the panelists. Let me uh, also uh, say that if please uh, stick to the question, get straight to the point. So that way we can get as many questions um, answered as possible. Uh, thank you so much for uh, everything that you said. Um, I had a question for all of you, particularly Yuri G. Um, so I know for a fact that in America and in England, 
we have Hindus on both sides of the political spectrum. The party, Labour Party, Conservatives, Democrats, Republicans. Um, do you think that it's a problem that if we become a voting bloc, that we um, identify with one particular party solely as to the detriment of the Hindu community? Because I think it's a good thing that we have people on both sides. I was wondering what your thoughts on this one. Yeah, so it's a really good question. And um, I think um, vote bank politics and dogmas in politics, um, which we should be, there should be no place for it actually in society. Unfortunately, when you see voting blocks like that occur, um, you actually end up seeing how to fraud and you see kind of like actually, I think, the disintegration of society. So I think it's really important. We're all different, you know. I'm sure everyone here doesn't support the same football team, and everyone here, you know likes different food, so we should all, I'm sure we all have different political ideologies and therefore should support different political parties. But yeah, we should definitely not get into a situation where being, we're being taken advantage of by politicians, because I've seen that in the States. Yeah, thank you. I would also like to add uh, to that. Uh, you know, people should vote for the party they, they agree with, but it's extremely important that uh, people of Indian origin or Hindu origin are active in all parties, and in this country it's majorly too, but uh, because uh, the Republicans are piled now, next time it'll be the Democrats, it'll be the Republicans again, and this is the same thing all over the world. Uh, no matter who is in power in our countries, we should be sure, sure that the interest of the Hindu community or, or uh, is taken care of, and that if any injustice happens against us, we are there to uh, uh, address it. We don't want appeasement, we don't want special favors, but we just want to make sure that our rights are taken care of, but who's in power? Please tell me your name and uh, yeah, from. sure. My name is Justin. I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Um, I'm a medical student, so we face a lot of discrimination, I guess, uh, from a social standpoint. We look at different uh, subset populations, regular populations, even in San Antonio. Uh, so I guess when we talk, when we were talking about the uh, placing the Hindu laws above other ethnic regional uh, causes, you know, I think that's important. But I know Mr. Galati also mentioned that we need to separate also true, I feel like, for health. So, I guess I'm having this internal conflict of, I believe that Hindu but where do we draw the line of, I identify as a Hindu, and I believe strongly in my faith, I'm proud of but how can I make sure that I'm not being discriminated because of my Okay, no, it's, it's, uh, 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 thank you for the question, and it's an interesting question with no straightforward answer, because like every, the world is not right and black, and you have to find a balance. My point was that uh, what you believe in, fight for. If you're a Hindu, be proud of it. Uh, our faith has formed most of us, but um, in politics, uh, if religion is the only guiding line, you either consciously or subconsciously try to uh, maybe push that onto others. That's not what, what you should do in politics. But uh, as a Hindu, if you see, uh, if you experience things that's unfair, uh, privileges not being given, etc., you know, then one should absolutely fight for that uh, from a political standpoint, fighting injustice, fighting for your rights. But, uh, but if religion is the only thing that drives you, uh, then uh, everything you do in politics will be about religion, and that should not be the case. And, and to your other point that, uh, um, Hindus, uh, in some aspects, are, uh, are, uh, are not as, uh, as high up uh, on the list uh, as other groups. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Indians are, and Hindus are doing great in America in many aspects, and um, in terms of uh, earnings, uh, etc. In some aspects, even better than the rest of the population. And uh, if there are uh, aspects we are not doing as good, you know, we should stand up and make sure that's not the case. Could you please come up front? Is there any questions? So, yeah. Yeah. So, just, so on that point, sorry as well. Um, I think that being we should be afraid to be Hindu. Like if you're if you're in politics, I think you should you should be proud to be a Hindu. If you see discrimination on any basis, whether it's your sex, your um, your um, your back, any your socioeconomic or economic background, your religion, your race, then you should fight against that. I don't think there's any conflict 
with and then any issue with saying that, like I, I, I think we did that with caste legislation in the UK. I, I vehemently disagreed that it was um, relevant to UK society um, at the time, and I believe that remedies existed within existing law to actually tackle any kind of discrimination on that basis. So, and I stood up against it, and I, I don't think that conflicted with me being, you know, in politics or anything. If we're looking at um, political candidates, you know, we talked about the 2008 election. Uh, Bobby Jindal, for example, he was initially interviewed. He changed his name to Bob so that he could, I mean, yeah, he was a governor of Louisiana, but at what cost, right? Uh, you have Tulsi Gabbard, you know, she's doing a great job. She's doing a great job now, and she's becoming the face of an aspect of Hinduism, but at what cost? Are we compromising the part of our identity to just stand up and take like, If you want to answer the question, you can. Yeah, sure. Sure, go for it. You can. So, he's so weak of so just go for it. Because there might, might not be a 
good environment right now to be a very active member because their software is very happy and they have to lose their life. How we can pressure internationally to uh, advocate their voices?
एकल प्रणाम आप सभी को मैं सुनीता मंसरिया रांची झारखंड भारत से आई हूँ आई हैव सैट थ्रू थ्री फोर सेशन द यूथ सेशन बेसिकली बिकॉज बैक होम ऑल्सो वी आर फॉर्मिंग यूथ विंग्स एंड देन सिंस द प्राइम मिनिस्टर ऑल्सो टॉकिंग अबाउट इंडिया बींग द यूथ कंट्री इन ऑल दिस सेशन माई टेक अवे इज दैट वी शुड बी we should be in the system the youth should be in the system if the youth is in the system irrespective of whether you are a hindu you are a muslim you are a christian you will be there what we are talking about hindu hindus being in the system hindu representation being more isn't that what we are all talking about so i don't think uh, i mean religion that is what i'm saying religion is not i mean if you are a hindu it is not necessary that uh, your hinduism will hamper or uh, discolor your outlook on politics as uh, you were talking so that is what uh, i was saying that even if you are in the all of us are there we will at some point of at some point of time uh, our beliefs will come over so that is what actually is there that is exactly what i want just wanted to uh, say is there any more questions um, just come up front please this, this is the last question all the hundreds of million people who have been here will not come no uh, that's what i said what i said was that those uh, the activist group that targeted us they walked to a mail to All of them. Oh, okay, sorry. So they went to extreme lengths to, uh, and uh, most of the people received them and didn't know really what it was. So they forwarded it to me to make sure anyone was aware. Yeah. So, anywho, so that we reached the conclusion of the session. The one thing we can take the takeaway here. is obviously a, num a number of them is that there are many issues for hindus that are faced in various parts of the world some countries they do it well others not so well the need is there for uh, more hindu representation in the politics and whilst yes when you ask the hindus they want to be in politics but when you ask them whether they ready to take the plunge they are a bit too shy so there's the need to obviously have that courage and that initiative remember those values that i talked about uh yesterday courage initiative respect and teamwork i think we could utilize that in our context to get more representation in the political uh sphere as um himanshu ji has shown it can be done even in a country like norway where the hindu population is probably not as big as what it is in some of the other diaspora communities and of course we have GHRD which is um doing what it can but unfortunately we as hindus more of us need to be aware more of us need to awaken ourselves and more of us need to arise and more of us need to be active and because we are the change that we wish to see and we are the masters of our destinies and the kings of who we see thank you